In this video, we're going to talk about the periodic table of the elements. Now, there's two important things you need to know about this. The columns are called groups. The rows are called periods. So this is group 1, group 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, and so forth. Now, the elements in a group share similar chemical properties. For instance, group one is known as the alkali metals. The alkali metals include lithium, sodium, potassium, rubidium, cesium, and francium. Hydrogen is not considered to be an alkali metal. The alkali metals, they're very reactive. All of these metals, they react violently with water. Some of them blow up with water. In fact, their reactivity increases as you go down a group which means that cesium is much more reactive than sodium. In fact, if you put cesium in water, it can blow up. There's a lot of YouTube videos that demonstrate this reaction. Whereas if you put sodium in water, it'll react vigorously, but it may not blow up as quickly as cesium would. One of the reasons for this is that cesium has a much lower melting point than sodium. In fact, the melting point of the alkali metals decreases as you go down the group. Alkali metals have a much lower melting point compared to other metals. The melting point of cesium is around 29 degrees Celsius, whereas the melting point of iron is around 1500 degrees Celsius. So what you need to understand is that elements in a given column, they share similar chemical properties compared to elements that are not in the same column. So for instance, group 16, these elements are known as the calcogens. They share chemi uh, similar chemical properties. These elements here, group 17, are known as the halogens. They're nonmetals and they have a similar chemical reactivity. So elements in the same group share similar chemical properties. The alkali metals also have low density values. The density of lithium and sodium is less than water. In fact, those elements will float on water. Whereas if you were to put iron metal in water, it will sink to the bottom because iron metal is much more dense than water. Now the next column, group two, This group is known as the alkaline earth metals. They include beryllium, magnesium, calcium, strontium, barium, and radium. The alkaline earth metals are reactive, but they're not as reactive as the alkaline metals. The alkaline metals are much more reactive than the alkaline earth metals. Next, we have the transition metals. The transition metals have multiple oxidation states. Now, just to compare and contrast, when the alkali metals, when they give up their electrons, they form ions with a positive one charge. So think of sodium plus or potassium plus. When the alkaline earth metals give up their electrons, they form cations with a two plus charge. So think of magnesium two plus, calcium two plus, strontium two plus, now the transition metals, they can form ions with variable charges. Iron, for instance, it can form the two plus ion or the three plus ion. Copper, there's copper plus one, there's copper two plus. So the oxidation states, the charges that the transition metals can have can vary widely. Now let's move on to the next group. So we discussed the calcogens and we also talked about the halogens. The halogens include fluorine, chlorine, bromine, and iodine. The calcogens include oxygen, sulfur, selenium, telluroium, 
and polonium. Next, we have the noble gases. The noble gases, they're chemically inert, they're non-reactive. For the most part, they don't participate in chemical reactions. It's extremely hard to get them to react with other elements. So we have elements like helium, neon, argon, krypton, xenon, and radon. Those are the noble gases. They're chemically inert. Now, there are other ways of naming the groups. So group 1 is also called group 1A. Group 2 is group 2A. Group 13, that's group 3A. 14 is 4A. This is 5A, 6A, 7A, and 8A. Now, those values also correspond to the number of valence electrons found in the elements of that group. So let's talk about that next. So group 1, or group 1A, this group has one valence electron. Group 2 has two valence electrons. Group 3A has three valence electrons. Group 4A, four valence electrons, and then 5, 6, 7, 8. Helium is an exception to this. Helium has two valence electrons, but the elements below that the other noble gases like neon, argon, krypton, they have eight valence electrons. A valence electron is the electrons that are in the outermost energy level, or the last energy level of an atom. Now the number of electrons gives us an idea of the type of charges that these elements will form. But before we talk about that, let's talk about metals non-metals, and metalloids. On the left side of the periodic table, we have the metals. Metals are electrical conductors. They allow electricity to flow through them. They can also conduct heat. They're malleable. They can be hammered into sheets. They're ductile. They can be pulled into wires. Copper and silver they're commonly used to form wires in electrical circuits. Metals, they also like to give away electrons, and as they do so, they become positively charged ions, known as cations. On the right side of the periodic table, we have nonmetals. The halogens are considered to be nonmetals. But the other nonmetals, which I highlighted in blue, that is in this group, these nonmetals, they like to take electrons. Metals like to give away electrons, nonmetals like to take electrons. Whenever a nonmetal takes an electron, it becomes negatively charged. Negatively charged ions are known as anions. Positively charged ions are known as cations. Metals like to form cations. Nonmetals like to form anions. So the elements in group one, the alkali metals, they like to form positively charged cations with a plus one charge because they only have one valence electron to give away. The alkaline earth metals, they have two valence electrons. When they give up those two valence electrons, they will form a cation with a positive two charge. So thus we have ions like Mg2+. Aluminum, which is in group 3A or group 13, it's going to form an ion, a positively charged ion, with a three plus charge. So as you can see, metals form cations, ions with a positive charge. And the charge is based on the number of electrons that they can give away. Nonmetals like to form anions, ions with negative charges. Fluorine is a halogen that has seven valence electrons. It's in group 7A or group 17. Now, the nonmetals, they like to take electrons, 
so that they can have a complete octet. They want to have eight valence electrons. Fluorine has seven and needs to acquire one electron to have eight. So fluorine will form an ion with a negatively one or a negative one charge. The chalcogens have six valence electrons. They're part of group 6A and they need two more to get to eight. So they like to form ions with a negative two charge. So we have oxide, which is O2 minus. Nitrogen and phosphorus, they have five valence electrons. They're both nonmetals, and so they like to acquire electrons. So they need three more to get to eight. So when they acquire the three electrons that they desire, they will have a three minus charge or negative three charge. So that's how you could determine the type of ions that these elements will form. Metals like to give away electrons to form positively charged ions. Nonmetals like to take electrons to form negatively charged anions. Now, keep this in mind. The noble gases are nonmetals. They are not me metallic. But even though they're nonmetals, they don't behave the same way as the other nonmetals. These nonmetals here, between groups 4a and group 7a, those nonmetals, they like to acquire electrons. The noble gases, they're nonmetals, but they don't like to acquire electrons, nor do they want to give away their electrons. They are already complete, they're happy, they're satisfied, they don't want to do anything. They just want to chill. So make, it, make sure you understand the distinction between those two types of nonmetals. The nonmetals, they don't conduct electricity, unlike metals. Metals are malleable and ductile, but the nonmetals, they're brittle. Between the metals and the nonmetals, we have a group called the metalloids. The metalloids, they don't conduct electricity as well as metals do, but they're not insulators like the nonmetals they can conduct a small amount of electricity. So they're called semiconductors. Two common semiconductors that you'll encounter are silicon and germanium. The electrical conductivity of semiconductors increases with temperature. So if you were to heat up silicon or shine light upon it, it's going to conduct electricity better compared to if you didn't do those things. So metals, they actually become less conductive if you increase the temperature. In fact, if you can cool a metal down to absolute zero, it can behave as a superconductor. Metalloids or semiconductors, they behave differently. Their conductivity increases with increase in temperature. Now, we talked about the vertical columns being called groups. One thing I didn't mention yet are the rows. The rows are called periods. So this is period one, period two, period three, and so forth. Over here, you have the lanthanides and the actinides. The lanthanides, they should be after barium. So starting with element 57, you have the lanthanides. After 88, you have the actinides, which starts at 89. So those are some other terms you need to be familiar with, the lanthanides and actinides. Now, the next thing we need to talk about is the stuff that's found next to the element. So the letter represents the symbol of the element. H stands for hydrogen. The top number is the atomic number. The atomic number is the same as the number of protons the atomic number identifies the element. So hydrogen always has one proton. Helium always have two protons in its nucleus. Beryllium will always have four protons in its nucleus. 
the number on the bottom, which is usually not a whole number, it's a decimal value, it represents the atomic weight, but more specifically, the average atomic mass of that element in its natural state on Earth. Now, for instance, if you look at carbon, you'll see that the average atomic mass is 12.01. The reason why it's not exactly 12 is because there are different forms of elemental carbon, known as isotopes. There's carbon-12, which can be written that way. When it's written that way, the 6 is the atomic number, the top number is the mass number. There's other isotopes of carbon. There's carbon-13, and there's also carbon-14. The mass number is the sum of the number of protons and neutrons. So carbon-12 has 6 protons, 6 neutrons. Carbon-13 has 6 protons, 7 neutrons. Carbon-14 has 6 protons, 8 neutrons. But all forms of carbon have 6 protons, which is the atomic number which identifies the element. Now, notice that the average is close to 12, 12.01. What that tells you is that this particular form of carbon is the most abundant isotope of carbon on Earth. Carbon-13 and carbon-14, they're pretty rare. So more than 99% of all the carbon atoms on Earth will be in the form of carbon-12. Less than 1% is carbon-13 and carbon-14. So if you have, let's say, 100 atoms of carbon, probably one of them will be carbon-13, and most likely the other 99 will be carbon-12. Now, since you're watching this video, it's likely that you're going to be quizzed on the names of the elements. So for instance, if you're given the chemical symbol of the element, Li, you need to know that this refers to lithium. If you see the symbol BE on your quiz, you need to know that this is beryllium. So let's talk about the common elements that you're most likely to be quizzed on. First, we have H, hydrogen. Hydrogen is the fuel that powers the stars of the universe. The sun converts hydrogen into helium in a process known as nuclear fusion. Helium, HE, it's found in hot air balloons. Well, not hot air balloons, but balloons that tend to rise. If you put helium in a balloon, because helium is less than air, those are the balloons that will go up. They won't fall to the ground, but they'll float high into the sky unless you hold them. Lithium is found in lithium ion batteries. Sodium is found in table salt. Table salt is sodium chloride. It contains sodium and chlorine in its ionic form. Magnesium is found in seawater. Calcium is found in your bones. Potassium in its ionic form, K plus, is found in bananas. Bananas are high in potassium. You know this one, iron metal. Fe doesn't sound like iron, but Fe is known as ferrous or ferric which is associated with iron. When you see C CU, think of cuprous or cupric, that's associated with copper. CO is cobalt, NI is nickel. The nickel, five cents, actually contains copper and zinc. But think of nickel cadmium batteries. That's where you'll find nickel. CD is cadmium. Copper is found in wires, the same thing as silver. Gold is the storage for wealth. PT is platinum, IR is iridium. Those are also rare metals. PD, palladium. Aluminum, think of aluminum foil. And gallium, that's a, a metal that can actually melt in your hand. Mercury is already a liquid at room temperature. So think of liquid metal, that's mercury. Carbon. There's many forms of carbon. 
Perhaps you heard of carbon dioxide. That's the stuff that we breathe out. Perhaps you heard of graphite in, uh, inside your pencil. Graphite can actually conduct electricity. It's an elemental form of carbon. Diamond is another form of carbon. Diamond is pure carbon, the same as graphite is pure carbon. But diamond doesn't conduct electricity. It does conduct heat. Graphite can conduct electricity. So graphite and diamond, they're allotropes of carbon. They're both pure elemental forms of carbon, but they have different structures. Silicon is found in solar cells. Germanium can also uh, be used to make solar cells as well. When you see SN, this represents tin. Think of a tin can. PB is lead. Think of lead acid batteries found inside your car. Nitrogen is found in the air. Almost 80% of air is composed of nitrogen, or 79% actually. About 20% of air is composed of oxygen. Then we have phosphorus, sulfur, selenium, Te, tellurium. Now, you need to be familiar with the diatomic elements. Nitrogen is diatomic. It's a molecule composed of two atoms of nitrogen. Oxygen gas is diatomic. Oxygen has two forms. Oxygen gas, the air that we breathe in, and ozone, O3, which is found in the upper atmosphere. So these are allotropes, or two different forms of the element oxygen. Next, we have fluorine. Fluorine is found in toothpaste in the form fluoride. Next, chlorine, that's also diatomic. Chlorine is typically used to disinfect pools. And then you have bromine, and then iodine. Iodine is found in table salt in the form iodide. Next, we have neon. Think of neon lights. There's argon. Argon is found in the air. Krypton. I think of Superman's kryptonite. And then we have xenon and then radon. Now, radon is interesting because radon can be formed from the decomposition of uranium, thorium, or radium. And because it's a gas, it can actually come from the ground and go up into your house. So if your home doesn't have good ventilation, if you don't open the windows, over time, radon can build. And this is a radioactive gas that can be hazardous to your health. So it's good to open the windows of your house to prevent the buildup of radon in your home. These elements, which I kind of touched on some of them, these elements are very rare and they're expensive. Silver, gold, palladium, platinum, the price of these metals are very high. We talked about uranium a little. Uranium is radioactive. That's found in, uh, it's used for nuclear fission. It's used in different nuclear reactors as well. And there's other elements to talk about, but we've covered the common ones. So that's basically it for this video. So make sure you know the names of the elements and the symbols that correspond to them. And that's that. Thanks for watching.